when you're having not as good a day or when things mm. have been a little more difficult, these thoughts can creep in of like, oh, like maybe this isn't a real relationship and I am more at risk of losing this mm -hmm. than someone else in a more intertwined relationship, in a more entangled relationship, right? Who has more shared finances, who owns a house together or whatever it is. They're like, maybe they're right. Maybe they are more secure than I am. And I am really going to end up alone. Like all of my friends or my family keep Worry worrying that I am. that's going to yeah. happen to me. If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non-monogamy, then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multiamory Podcast. On this episode of the Multi Emory Podcast, we're talking about hangovers. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, not the hangover that you get after drinking all night, but the residual thoughts and assumptions and habits and things that are instilled in us from a very early age by our movies and our books and our music. In other words, the outdated and unhealthy models that we're given for how relationships are supposed to look. Mm. Yeah, so we thought that we would talk about this today. Um, there was a thread in our private Patreon discussion group, specifically about what people are referring to as um, the monogamy hangover. And we didn't quite want to just focus on that particular term for a couple of reasons. One of them, like I, I immediately have a little bit of pushback on that term because I'm like, oh, I don't know how I feel about treating monogamy like it's this toxic awful poisonous day, thing terrible that, thing yeah it gives yeah. you this awful hangover and it's super painful and it's like you just got to get it out of your system as soon as possible i'm sure people definitely can experience it that way i've definitely experienced it that way to a certain degree but i but i don't want it to be just like this black and white like monogamy is the bad thing that you got to detox from yourself yeah yeah i think i mean using the term hangover for it is honestly a little bit weird because you know, a hangover, it's like, well, I did this thing the night before too much. Like I did something to excess and now the next day, it doesn't mean I'm not going to do I that thing again. I did too much monogamy I, the night before. Right. Like it's, it's just, it's just a little weird. I guess I get it. Like, I still like with the Japanese definition of mono or of, not of monogamy, but of, of uh, a hangover. What did you say? It's yeah. like the second day drunk. Yeah, the word is futsukayoi, which literally translates to second day drunk, which is kind of a misnomer. I think it yeah. makes a hangover sound more exciting and fun than it actually is in yeah. reality. You're like, ooh, second day of being drunk, great. No, I've had some really wicked hangovers, yeah. so let's not do that again. Haven't we all? Right. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so we're not calling it the monogamy hangover on this episode also uh, because jace discovered that that term's actually trademarked in the uk that's amazing believe it or not yeah so this this company trademarked the term monogamy hangover and they have like you know you can pay to do workshops or like take their classes and stuff about it um so it is specifically like non-monogamy focused workshops and stuff yeah so oh. from from what i could gather the company itself is not um they're not specifically like only non-monogamy focused but they're like poly friendly, non monogamy friendly. Mm. Like that's kind of part of it. But it's sort of a a company that does um, relationship coaching and therapeutic stuff and like workshops okay. and and those sorts of things. Anyway, so yeah, there's like technically a couple companies that jointly own this this trademark. Mm. Oh, I um, see. So anyway, I guess, in the UK, so we we actually, because we're in we the US, we could have titled our episode that. But I'm also like, well, that's kind of like a specific thing that someone is is selling. And whether it's good or not, I don't know. Like whether it's a helpful workshop, I don't know. I guess the lesson is just like, especially if you're in the UK, don't start making some t-shirts <laughs> right. and selling them the same monogamy <laughs> hangover on it. I don't know why you would, mm -hmm. but just, you know, don't do that because yeah. trademark laws. Well, right. Okay, when we're talking about this at all, when we're talking about something that is deemed the monogamy hangover, or when we're talking about what we want to delve into in this episode, what does that entail exactly? 
Right. Well, I think one thing that we do want to differentiate here is that we're not just talking about stuff that's like leftovers of monogamy after you've decided not to be monogamous, but we're more talking about it generally as like, if you've de- like, if you've made this conscious decision to change the way you approach relationships and think about relationships, whether that's in a monogamous way or a polyamorous way or something else, Mm -hmm. but you have made this conscious decision to like, I'm going to step away from what society teaches me is normal or like what's kind of the standard thing of like what you should aspire to, what you should want. Mm. Um, That when you step away from that, you can be like, yeah, yeah, I believe these different things. And on a good day, that is true. Mm -hmm. But this is about what happens, like, if things are a little bit difficult, or if you're doubting yourself one day, or you're just not feeling as on top of the world that day, these sort of, like, lingering kind of, like, ghosts that come to haunt you. (laughs) What if, okay, what if we called it... The ghosts of monogamy past. (laughs) Yes, well, what if we, if we zoomed out a bit and made Mm -hmm. a little bit more expansive, and it was more about, like, a normativity hangover mm. because when we're talking oh. about this, I realize this can apply to many other arenas of one's life, not just relationships, you know, like That's for instance, yeah. uh, what shows up in my life? Like some kind of like economic normativity hangover of uh-huh. like, your life has to, you have to be this, uh, I have to be making well this. Off. Yes. I have to be making this much money. I should be aspiring to own these particular kind of things. Mm -hmm. I should be aiming for this particular type of career. You should own a house. I should be productive at all hours of the day. And my worth is measured by my productivity. So there's definitely that kind of hangover where it's like, logically, I'm like, I know that's not true. I feel really satisfied in my life. I feel like the things I'm pursuing are worthwhile. Um, But those kind of old feelings, like, yeah, that ghost of normativity past, (laughs) I think, can still come come up and kind of ruin your day occasionally. Yeah. I think that um, for me that shows up in uh, what I will now coin the term job normativity. Oh, oh, all right. (laughs) (laughs) Just pick it up and run with it. Yeah, just go with it. Uh, Job normativity, which is this idea that, that you should want to have kind of, um, you know, a a normal full-time job for a company that you're trying Mm. to move up in within an industry or whatever, Climbing right? That corporate ladder. Yeah, in whatever your industry is. And I know that for me, my aspiration is to move away from that. And I have been gradually moving away from that. But people will look at me and go, oh, I, I worry about you. That that eventually you're going to end up old with like nothing saved up and you're going to be living on the streets, basically. I, they didn't say it quite like that. But right, that sort of thing. Or that I don't own a house or whatever, like like Dedeker said. And that's not to say that I, I won't, but those aren't like, I don't have quite those same aspirations. And when I'm feeling down, I will doubt that myself because it's like, well, everyone else thinks this. Like, what if they're right? Like, maybe I'm mm-hmm. the one who's who's wrong here. Do you think that all of those things are kind of a product of our specific society, like here in America? Because I know we may have listeners out there who come from different places that may have a whole different set of expectations or not exactly the ones where we're like in the super de- competitive culture with one another and and super like we need to live up to the American dream that we were promised, you know? Well, I don't know. My theory is I think a lot of these things are somewhat inherent to Western culture. And yeah. because Western culture has been so prolific and uh, we'll just say colonial, um, uh-huh. you know, that that bleeds into a lot of other cultures that maybe didn't hold values that were that similar, I think. I, we mm-hmm. could really get into the specifics, but I think that's just like a whole, that's that's turning things into a whole other topic. Um, right. But I think, I think there are parts of it that are uniquely American, but I also think a lot of it is just kind of broadly Western, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. And I would bet that, that, People Maybe listening a capitalist, in other... Western capitalist. We right. Get yeah, more capitalism, I think, definitely yeah. well, adds to that equation hugely. Mm-hmm. I think that patriarchy is also a part of it. Oh, for sure. So, oh, just all the good things. All the good things, yeah. Um, <laughs> but but I think that this that, like there may be subtle like shades are slightly different mm. in other countries, but I feel like at least most countries 
where people would be listening to this podcast will at least be able to relate to the majority of, of the stuff here. Cause I feel like, like Dedeker said, that culture has so colonialized mm. the world and impacted the world through movies and literature and TV and, you know, music and entertainment. And then also just in those things like capitalism and patriarchy and, you know, yeah, it's very that. prevalent. Well, so, but to bring it back in, if our focus for today is kind of like the relationship normativity hangover, let's say. I'm going to stop. Let's, no. The you ghosts wanna... of normativity past. I really like that. That was, that was good. Okay. Okay. The ghosts of relationship normativity past. TM, 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 TM. That's going to be what we trademark and we'll put it on our t-shirts. And that's what we'll Don't title you put our that workshops. On a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's start getting into the specifics of what sort of relationship based or sex based lingering beliefs Mm. Um, do a lot of us still carry? And again, this isn't specifically like those of us who are just choosing non-monogamy, but I mean, pretty much like everyone who's trying their hand at this whole adult relationship thing. What are some particular things? I have one. The idea that like you need to search for your one true love or just your one, Mm -hmm. the one or your soulmate. Um, all of those things that we've seen in like books or fairy tales Mm. or whatever. I mean, I was hanging out with a friend the other day and she's like, well, you know, I haven't found the one yet. And I don't know if I can have kids because I haven't found the one yet. And I'm 32 years old. So by the time I find the one and then marry him and have kids, I'm going to be like 40. (laughs) Okay. It's just like a lot of assumptions based on like what you have to do in order to, to have the life you want. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Just that, that that that's like the thing that we aspire to. We talked about this a bit last week and in the relationship goals. But I think that, right. yeah, that that's like a personal goal that a lot of people have in the back of their head always. It's well, like, like finding well, the one. I'm looking or... for the one. Yeah. Which is fine, but also yeah. maybe not always productive. Well, I feel so torn by it because it's. I feel like. Oh, I don't know, y'all. I'm sorry. No, okay, I, yeah. you know, no, I, I honestly, I feel like I divested myself of any belief in soulmates in the one like a long time ago. Like honestly, even mm-hmm. before I was on the non-monogamy train, I was already kind of like non-mog train. That non-mog train, and I was already kind of <laughs> like, mm, I don't know about this because it's like, well, statistically, like, there's how many people in the world, and mm. why is it that everyone's one happens to be like, oh, you know, they happen there to. There they are. There they they're, are. They're right in front of me. They wow. were just, you what know, happened to be the same, the same, like, destiny. the same, like, skin color and socioeconomic bracket. <laughs> yeah, and like, we just happened to, you know, be interested in the same kind of job. And they're the one, you know. And so I was kind of like, well, I don't know about that. Um, right. I, for me, because I was raised in a Christian home, it was much more wrapped up in this idea of, like, God has this plan for you. God has someone picked out for you. Mm-hmm. And they're, you know, God's going to send this man, this perfect man, this man who's going to be your husband to you. And that's why it's, you know, worth waiting to have sex until you get married. And that's why it's worth not dating around because, you know, you got to trust that God's going to send this stuff to you. And so for me, it was a little bit less of this mystical thing and more of like, there's a higher power who is looking for your reordained. Yeah. It's kind of like it's preordained. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. See, that's something that I never grew up with. So just all of that, like kind of soulmate, one any soulmate kind of- training yes <laughs> when i was my very first boyfriend uh-huh. in high school who turned out to be a real piece of work and was really really mean to me mm. and abusive later on but initially yeah my mom was like and i think just because it was going well in a lot of nre and stuff and she's like well maybe you found your one like already <gasps> what? what no i no. know right no. i know his mom i know I, <laughs> you were how old were you like eight F- 15 <laughs> You may as well have been eight. Yeah, I know. <laughs> me, I was eight. It feels just eight. as ridiculous felt, as saying I, to an eight-year-old, maybe you found the one. No, I, I hear you. I, I agree. And I mean, you know, at the time I was like wrapped, it, totally wrapped up in the emotion of it yeah. all because what freaking teenager isn't wrapped up in the emotion of literally everything? Yeah, I was going to say, I would almost trust an eight-year-old's opinion of finding the one no. more than a teenager <laughs> because they don't have all these the hormones, hormones convincing no, I think, them. Yeah, I think that that's fair. So <laughs> well, it was, uh, yeah, I, I, but but in terms of like the possibility of like, I've heard the term Catholic guilt a lot Mm. or like the guilt involved in like, well, you know, you're giving your flower away to someone every time you sleep with them. 
I've heard I've heard that before. Like some sort oh, of yeah, there's all kinds. flower metaphor. No, there's all kinds Am of I terrible wrong? metaphors. That like, is, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. There's a metaphor of like you're a piece of tape and every time the tape sticks to something, it's a little less sticky. And I then who wants what? this like... Oh, I have never no, heard that. Literally, what? I am not exaggerating. There's also the... You the, um, are a piece of tape? <laughs> there's the piece of gum one of like... You, you know, if someone chews up the gum, you... you don't want to take that gum out of their mouth and then chew it up yourself, especially if it's been chewed by 10 people. Holy you know, shit. you don't want to have that gum. There's the, the you're used a piece of gum one. There was one that I saw where like a bunch of kids, oh gosh, a bunch of kids were stood up at the front of a classroom and like everyone had a cup of water and everyone had a little bag of Doritos and everyone ate a Dorito and then took a sip of water, swished it out, and spit it back into oh, the cup. And okay. then everyone swapped cups. And okay. everyone was like, okay, take a drink of that cup. You don't want to, do you? Because someone's like swished around and spit in it. Well, that's what happens when you have sex. And to wait a, a certain minute, extent, wait a I'm minute, like, wait a minute, well, wait a yes. minute. Were these things that actually occurred in class? This actually occurred, Emily. It actually occurred. <laughs> I <laughs> Emily's mind is melting out no, of her ears No, I mean, right like, now. I have to say, like, if... I'm pretty sure if my mother ever like knew any of that would have been going on, she would have like taken me out immediately. Like that is some really, really awful shit to be telling your kid. For and sure. just that they were like, that that's all it, that they amount to. It, it is, also, a, is a chew, yes. chewed up Dorito in a glass of water. It also completely Ugh. negates like anyone's experience of like being raped or assaulted. Yeah. Are you fucking you know, kidding me? There were a I'm lot sorry. of assault victims who like many years later did come forward being like, I remember that piece of tape talk and where it's like, <gasps> well, I didn't consent to this, but now I'm a used up piece of tape oh, or a chewed God. up piece of gum and no one's going to want me. I'm so, right. the- so sorry. Yeah, the whole thing is is awful, uh, and uh, but I, I do want to bring us back to the topic. Yeah, we don't gotta here. get. Too I feel like that. <laughs> I feel like we've we've basically touched on two other topics that I think could be complete episodes mm. on their own. I think oh. I honestly think we could do an entire episode about the one and soulmates mm. and that whole thing. Yeah. I think that would actually be really interesting. I was actually just this morning writing some stuff about that and i did some research on that in my book about like the origin of of mm. the whole one mythos or soulmate mythos and it's actually only what like 300 maybe 400 years old no not even that old actually so it's actually a relatively new concept within our i don't know human right like renaissance yeah period i'm gonna say zeitgeist yeah and then and then of course you know problems with sort of the the religious guilt and and some of the ways that that's taught to us when we're younger whether we're raised christian or not like mm. that's still kind of in the culture and is influencing yeah, but, people who are then influencing cool. you but what i want to bring this back to on this topic is how would these two things like can you give examples of how these things would actually show up yes like as this sort of ghost of I can give you a billion, relationship I can normativity give you past. one billion examples, but we don't Wait, have one time. billion. billion okay, one. number one. <laughs> no, <laughs> Sorry, I'm not gonna. Say <laughs> uh, uh, uh. The way okay, the one way that I've definitely seen it show up in my life and in the lives of clients and the lives of many other people is it really makes things fuzzy when someone's trying to leave a bad relationship because I've seen. I've definitely told myself the story of like, well, this feels crappy, but like maybe this person is the one mm. and like, and this if is, I miss out on this. Yes. Then. And I can't miss out on this. And this is, you know, either it's like God's doing this to test us and to test our love, or it's something along the lines of like, you know, and this is just how it goes. You know, it's like, they're the one. And so they're going to be worth every single battle. They're going to be worth every single obstacle. Um, so basically I guess I've seen it keep me in some really poor relationships much longer then I should have. I've seen a lot of people go back to really bad relationships because they think like, oh, this person's the one. Um, so that's, I mean, that's how I've definitely seen it manifest in wow. people's lives, including my own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it can also show up as a sense of sort of entitlement to someone else. Mm-hmm. Because um, if I feel this strongly about you and I believe you're the one that mythology doesn't leave an option where you don't also love me. Mm. You know, you maybe Mm. just don't know it yet. And I I feel like that can end up in maybe even the flip side of what Dedeker's talking about, where you like keep going back to a relationship being like, or staying in one. Maybe it's the one is also like feeling like you need to keep someone else in a relationship with you when they're not happy Mm. um, because well, they're the one like, yeah. So it's going to work out. Mm. Kind of this just like, I believe it. So therefore it's true. 
obviously the two of you are not particularly religious anymore in any sense of the word. Uh -huh. However, I definitely have heard you be like, like the guilt thing is like shown up at times in various ways or, or just like, like you've been like, huh, like at things because you've had like religious upbringing, like way, way deeply buried in your past kind of thing. Well, I feel I like thought that I've heard you talk about that on the show. You've talked about that too, though. Emily, no, for like, sure. I mean, in terms of I, I like, I don't think it's just religion that gives us yeah. that guilt about, about like, sex or about, no, I mean, again, like it. our patriarchal culture and the Madonna horror complex and all those things mm. like, it wanting sex or wanting to be sexual or sexual in certain ways or whatever, or, you know, anything other or anything that's not deemed normal definitely like has a potential for guilt being attached to that. So, yeah. yeah. Gosh. Yeah. That's a deep dive to go into. You brought up the Madonna horror complex and, and connected to religious guilt and just general guilt. I, I mean, I, I think that, what I definitely feel to a certain extent is pretty American from mm. what I've seen. But again, that's not necessarily scientific. That's just anecdotal based on my experience. Um, As an American. Is that sex is just a rife topic to feel guilty. However, whatever way you slice it, you know, whether, whether, and especially if you're a woman, um, whether it's like you want too much sex or you don't want sex enough or the kind of sex you want isn't okay. Or, you don't want to have the kind of sex that I want. And so that's okay. You know, like, I, I guess, and I feel like a lot of that is really wrapped up in just a lot of the cultural messages that we receive about sex or, or making sex like way, way, way important in a relationship where it's like, if we're not quite sexually compatible, that means the entire thing's off. Um, yeah. Or so if we're only sexually compatible and then in the rest of our relationship, we just kind of get along as friends or maybe we're okay just being acquaintances um that that's not okay you mm -hmm. know it's like it's like the whole topic i think people have many different variations of kind of the old baggage and the old stuff that comes up but it's often related to to sex yeah yeah well, i think you touched on one that i've definitely noticed comes up a lot for people and has come up in my own relationships is that sort of equating love with sex mm -hmm. and being like, if you're in love, you must also be wanting to have sex and, and having sex with and each other. And great at sex too with that person. Sure that too. Yeah. yeah. So like if the sex isn't good, then they must be this, not be the one. Well, <laughs> they all look back on themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like they must not be the one or like, well, we must not be in love anymore. Like mm. this sort of equating mm. of like our sex life has fallen off. So we must not be as in love as we were that those things oh, can yeah. kind of get get conflated with each other i guess that that also builds into um like if we're not feeling nre for each other anymore yeah then, that's a good which one is too. like ridiculous like, i feel like i've started just i don't know i've picked up more of a cultural narrative around people accepting that it's like those feelings of nre do fade and they do turn into like more bonding feelings and that's okay however when it comes to sex specifically I noticed they're still kind of hanging on to this, like, how do we get the sex back to how it was when we were in NRE? Mm. You know, and so that's, many things for, and like, for married people yes. written about that specifically. Yeah. yeah. How to make your sex life up, you know, you like know, you are 20 again or something. Or something like that. Yeah. And just like, I think there's definitely a lot of really wonderful intentional things that you can do to have your sexual connection with your partner be awesome. And I think that you should be doing those things if that's, if, if both of you are interested in sex. Um, uh -huh. Uh, but, but there's it's hard still to like it to think that like, you're going to be fucking like two times a day, like yeah. seven days a week. Like you might've been right when you met each other. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Who, exactly. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> Shit. Well, In this economy. I mean, may maybe, <laughs> but I feel like what I feel like people, I think we acknowledge that. And most people, when you say that they're like, yeah, yeah, of course. But I feel like underneath the surface, a lot of people do feel a certain amount of, I don't know, maybe guilt or disappointment or like, oh, well, oh, if, totally. if I really I was with the one, like that wouldn't ever have gone down like that. I, I think also related are definitely this idea of I need to be the best sexual partner my partner's ever had. Oh, wow. And oh, my yeah. God. Related yeah, to that, definitely. I need to be willing and able to do absolutely everything my partner wants to do in bed. And yeah. if I can't, then... I risk losing that person. Um, gotta be 
amazing at X, Y, uh, or Z thing. Yeah. And yeah. super into this as well. And yeah, no, there's so much, I don't know. It's really sad. Cause I think back on like so much, so many kinds of sex that I had that I didn't really want to have. And I mean, that makes it sound really bad. It's not that it wasn't consensual or, or, or that it was forced upon me. It was more of like, because of this narrative I want to of, be the cool girl. Yeah, if I don't do this thing that my partner's asked me to do, then he's going to be so disappointed that he's going to go find it, someone else to do it with. Totally. And while now I'm kind of like, great, <laughs> please do. You do that. Um, <laughs> go on. I think back then, even even when I was getting into my first non-monogamous relationships, I still felt that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, again, it's like yeah. that competitive side also being like, shit, mm. like... I'm I'm in a sense like competing against all of their my partner's previous partners yeah. and, all the, and all the potential partners, partners that they may yeah. have and I have to live up to that and step up to that. Mm-hmm. And you know like in acting school so many people they would tear you down obviously but then a lot of the teachers would after tearing you down be like you are enough. You are enough. Like you don't have to try to be anything other than you. You are enough. And that might be like kind of ridiculous advice, but I think it is true in these senses because when, even mm. if like you don't want necessarily the same kind of sexual things that your partner does, you have to understand like you as yourself have amazing qualities that your partner is interested in, even if it's not just for your like ridiculous sexual prowess mm. and all the like anal that you want to do with them constantly or whatever. Or whatever, Just whatever, it whatever it happens to be, anal. or a specific type of role play, or a I'm sorry, specific whatever, or it's group you know. sex, or yeah, that yeah. too, whatever. I just yeah. watched Requiem for a Dream, so that that last scene is in my head is all that I'm gonna say. Yeah. Well, instead of talking about Requiem for a Dream, <laughs> let's talk about the the that sensation of like not enough, or or of needing, Neither or of like. <sighs> Has anyone seen? No. No. Uh, but this idea that I th- I think starts to bleed over, especially when people are exploring non-monogamy, is this idea of you as you are need to be enough, not in the sense of like like what you were talking about, Emily, of like, oh, you need to accept yourself because you're enough and you're good and you're whole and you're valid, but more of like, I need to be enough to fulfill every single one of my partner's needs, which is a, a path well-traveled within these circles and these conversations about someone not necessarily being able to fulfill all of your needs. Um, But there's still a very present thing that people feel like they need to live up to, you know, best friend, lover, amazing sexual partner, confidant, mother, father, personal trainer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nurse. Therapist. (laughs) Therapist. Oh my gosh. Everything. And it's not that, I mean, when I think about my relationships now, like I think about my partners and each of them have filled that role at some point or or another, but they've never been the only person filling that role in my life. And they've like, probably never done it all at the same time or like... Yes. Like, the, like let's yeah. say like the therapist role, for instance. It's like, yeah, I go to Jace a lot. I go to Alex a lot to talk about things and to process mm-hmm. things but i also go to a regular therapist and i also go to like friends and right. family they're, you know, they and don't have to fill that job completely yeah. 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 yeah 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 that's really interesting right or like having friends to hold you accountable for things or or whatever mm-hmm. yeah can, can we talk about mowage mowage arrangement mowage <laughs> who was that no that wasn't uh what's his butt wallace sean no wallace sean was bassini Oh yeah, um, they're talking about Princess Bride for those of you who are with question oh, marks. Oh come over your on, heads. I'm who sure hasn't they all seen knew. that show. There might be a few people. Might um, be a few people. So there's still obviously this idea. I think even even in the back of one's mind, even if you're not practicing like hierarchy, that if you are married, it still like holds a huge amount of weight in non-monogamous relationships and in monogamous relationships that like it is the pinnacle of all relationship statuses stati statuses <laughs> data St- I, I don't know stratums Stati. stratums yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah uh, yeah no that's a great point that that um that again this applies whether you're monogamous or non-monogamous mm-hmm. but just this idea that 
it's not real unless it's marriage. Mm. And I think what goes along with that too, is if you've been married and have been divorced that you're somehow less than oh, now. Yeah. That, or well, like you're, any you're on your second relation. or third marriage. So, right. mm. or if you're in a relationship for many, many years and you never get married, they're like somehow, right. It's like, not well, real. it's not really like, what are you doing? You're not mm-hmm. really committing or you're, I guess you're just holding out to see if like, something better comes along. Yeah, I was reading an interesting editorial recently that obviously like our generation of millennials are showing different patterns of marriage than our parents' generation, namely that fewer of us are getting married. Most of us who do get married are getting married much later in life, um, you know, kind of post-career or, Mm -hmm. you know, post-establishing career or or whatever. Um, And some people attribute that to oh yeah, you know, values around marriage are changing. And I do think part of it is that, you know, I do think it helps when you have women who are able to make a living for themselves and not necessarily dependent upon finding a spouse. Um, But other people have pointed out that it's like, it's kind of shifted now, like because of, you know, the economy and job opportunities being so bad, combined with freaking weddings being so expensive, that Uh, now mm. for millennials, marriage has also become kind of a status symbol as well Um, you know that it's like you finally get to the point where you're financially stable enough that you can afford the house and you can afford the you know having the the marriage ceremony and all those things that to so it's kind of like a milestone i mean it's always been considered a milestone but kind of in this much different way than it was for our parents i think yeah yeah I think that, I mean, going along with this, we'll just segue right into the relationship escalator. Of course. And that's whether or not it's marriage specifically, but this idea that in order for a relationship to be real or to be serious, it needs to be moving upward on this trajectory toward certain things being, you know, certain things being entwined with each other or that it has to have these aspects to it whether those are sex that it has to have, you know, certain types of sex, or it has to be living together, it has to be sharing finances. And even if we, like like the three of us who, you know, very vocally speak about like, well, it doesn't have to have all those things. I don't have all those in my relationships. Those aren't goals of mine in all of my relationships. There still can be this like, again, like when you're having not as good a day or when mm. things have been a little more difficult, these thoughts can creep in of like, oh, like maybe this isn't a real relationship and I am more at risk of losing this Mm -hmm. than someone else in a more intertwined relationship, in a more entangled relationship, right? Who has more shared finances, who owns a house together or whatever it is. Like Maybe they're right. Maybe they are more secure than I am and I am really going to end up alone like all of my friends or my family keep worrying worrying that I am. That's going to happen to me. And that, that's kind of what we're getting at here with all of these, you know? Yeah, I've definitely pulled the cohabiting one of, of first of all, of just assuming like, well, all my romantic relationships need to lead to cohabitation. But I've also pulled the, if I choose to cohabit with this person, it will make the relationship more secure. Mm. Um, which... Sometimes that's the opposite of Yes, the well, from my experience, like, it kind of does on a surface level at the very least to start, but... If it wasn't feeling secure before, like usually that indicates there's some more fundamental issues that are going to follow you even when you choose to start living together was the painful lessons that I've had to learn over the course of my adult life. Yeah. I mean, that's actually been, it's not wrong that it will make you more likely to stay together longer by living together is not necessarily wrong. Like there have been studies showing that doing those sorts of of things that basically make it harder to break up do make you less likely to break up because of the like the the, the troubles involved and the barriers mm. to it like sort of the the uh, the sunken cost fallacy is what it's called in business yeah. right it's like well but i've i've invested this much and i've become this entwined so i should stick it out a little bit longer but all of this it kind of it goes back to maybe something we didn't even put on our list here, but could belong there, which is that like the marker of a good relationship is simply time. Mm. Mm. Right. That, that, that idea that like, well, it doesn't matter if we're happy or not. What matters is that we last longer. 
I mean, to go back to the religion thing, like some people literally say, like, I don't believe in divorce. So even in a loveless marriage where I'm seriously unhappy and depressed all the time, I've had friends who are religious who say this. Mm -hmm. They're like, I won't divorce my partner because God does not believe in divorce i feel like that also gets connected to not even religiously specific ideas around well that can be like parents well the idea it's like saying don't do this it's like selfish to advocate for your own happiness in a Mm. relationship it's noble to suffer through a bad relationship and again these things get foggy because to a certain extent like you know, of course you can't be advocating for only your own happiness in a relationship and not caring about the feelings of others. So there's like a little bit of truth in that. And then also, yes, like you are going to have to deal with things being uncomfortable or or there being conflict or, you know, disagreements or, or you know, periods of discomfort in your relationship. Um, so there's a little bit of seed of truth to that. But then I think it often gets interpreted as this extreme of, it's if you're unhappy that's okay because it's worth it to suffer through a bad relationship for the sake of them either being the one or making a relationship work or or being able to squeeze an extra five years out of your relationship or or something like that yeah i was just reading some stuff earlier from the gottman institute um earlier today about kind of like how it's normal for relationships over time to go through hardships and difficult things and but what matters in terms of relationships being happy together, like people being happy together is how they think about those things, not Mm. just whether they got through them or not. It's like how they felt about that experience. Mm. Was it like we together overcame this thing and it was good? Or was it like, it's still this thing I look back on as like with shame or with a sense of failure or still like resentment about this thing we went through Mm. that, that it's like, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is just that like while things aren't always going to be easy and fine, that just getting through stuff and just lasting longer is not the marker of a happy relationship. Yeah. So what are the things that are really specific to non-monogamy when we're talking about all of these like hangovers that occur or, or whatever. What do we want to call it now? The the ghosts of the normativity ghosts. past. Sorry, the the normativity, <laughs> the normativity ghosts. The normativity ghosts. How do they? Echoes how do they, of normativity. Oh, if, that's going to be my album name uh, <laughs> oh my someday. God. Echoes of normativity. <laughs> People would be like, "What is he?" Okay, I no, because it's going to be you know the crowd that it's for. They'll they'll get it. They'll get it. Okay, yeah. well that's good. Yeah. Well, what are those normativity echoes that occur? when you're specifically in a non-monogamous relationship. Well, let's talk about the ghost of hierarchy <laughs> past. <laughs> the ghost of hierarchy past. Uh, it's not about hierarchy specifically. If y'all want to listen more in depth about our thoughts and feelings and philosophies about hierarchy, you can check out specifically the episode that we did on it. And I don't have the episode number. So you're going to have to go to multiamory.com and just type in hierarchy into our search, website, bar. search bar and you will find it. Um, Andy dandy. Anyway, oh. it's not just a hierarchy specific thing. For me, it was very much this long lingering idea of, well, whatever happens, I need to be number one. Mm. Um, you're number one. However that looks, whether that's being called primary or i'm the girlfriend and everyone else is a hookup or whoa whatever else you wanted to call it 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 was just like i need to be number one or i need to feel number one or i need to be the most special out of everybody was that Um, with everyone were you ever like in a position where you were like i am fine being the hookup to this person or the secondary to this person um let me think like for it, a while, like you had a primary and Brad and Jason and I were primaries, kind y- of. Yes, yeah. I'm thinking more and more further back. More I, more I was okay back. being someone's hookup, but if they had like a hardcore primary partner, I really didn't want to know about it and didn't want to get too involved. What? Um, and you were definitely like a don't ask, don't tell, lady. I I don't. I mean. It's, it's blurry between like what was me specifically wanting don't ask, don't tell versus what was me 
dealing with the ghost of casual dating past uh, and like casual dating behavior, it's the assumption that which you is just the don't assum- talk about yeah, the it. assumption being you just don't talk about I it. See. Um, so there was kind of that, I suppose. Yeah, that makes sense. But I feel like this one actually may be one of the most malignant ghosts uh, mm. that is really hard to get rid of. Is this idea that? Oh yeah, non-monogamy is all all fine and philosophically I get it and it's all great, but I still want to be the best. I still want to be wanna the be most special. important person to like, to this person. I want to be yeah. the very best like no one ever was. Yeah. Right. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um Yeah, I guess that and it's something that I I feel it like comes up a lot in stuff people mention in like the private patron group. Or just in our own personal experiences, our personal lives, relationships with people, um, you know, in our own hangups that have come up at times. Like, I feel like this is a big one because that's with, with some of the stuff we were talking about in the first half of the episode, they all kind of come back a little bit to this idea of the one or like that things are predestined, um, that there's kind of this sense of like, <laughs> I guess the sort of this sense of magic around the relationship, mm. this sort of like a mythology or like sort of a, a spiritual like faith about that relationship that we're, we're sold that. And in the, in the world of like unhealthy monogamy, I'll say um, there's kind of that you're trying to force that to fit. You're trying to force that to happen, or you're making assumptions about other people because of those beliefs or, or right for, for, mostly for bad, but I was going to say for good or bad. Um, and then in this, it's like, even in non-monogamy, you kind of, you kind of let go of that, but there's still this hanging on idea of like, but in order to like actually be loved, I need to be the most special mm. that there's, there's that. And it's, that's a, a difficult one to let go of. Or even time. the most special at something like, like I'm the, I'm the best at giving you blowjobs. Out of all your partners, like even just that, like the word like best or special, like comes into play. I think, again, we're kind of in this competitive mindset. So many of us that like we still need to top someone else, even if that someone else is like the loving partner of our partner our loving metamorph. It's like the it's like thinking of it as a competition where like if I'm not the best, then they're going to leave me. Yeah, because yeah. that's it's all a competition. It's all very much like because we're all kind of on this path of just upgrading our partner one after the other, mm, right? You know yeah. the way we upgrade our technology. Yeah, and get that yeah. new iPad. Yeah, we just hop from new model to new model to new model to new model, and so it's like you have to try to maintain being, yeah, just the best and like the newest mm-hmm. and the shiniest at all times, or else yeah. you're going to get left for someone else. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of people being left. There yeah. is that like idea and that fear that maybe someday you'll be left for someone who wants to be monogamous again. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely have that fear because of how many times I've it's s- happened. Well, it has happened. Yeah. I wouldn't say to me it's happened like an excessive number of times, but it has happened for sure. And then I've also just witnessed what, how do I want to describe this? I've definitely witnessed relative newbies to non-monogamy experience kind of their first NRE with a new partner and get caught up in all our mythology around NRE of like, oh, if you're feeling this way, that must mean you need to be with this person. Maybe they're actually the one, mm. you know. Mm-hmm. I've even seen people who identify as polyamorous even start to toss out like, oh, maybe I'm with the wrong primary. Maybe this person I'm in an NRE with should be my actual primary, which yeah. is just kind of like the same mythology, but with different labels put onto it, mm. you know? Yeah, um, that's interesting, yeah. And so I definitely have that fear, especially surrounding like anytime I date a partner who's relatively new to things of like, okay, this is all fine and good, but I've never met this person yet. Or like, I don't know this person and how they respond to NRE. And so I don't know if like, if NRE hits this person, if they're just going to be like, Oh, well, see ya, you know? Mm -hmm. So I definitely have that fear. I have that less with partners where like, you know, I've been around them when they're in NRE with people and they've gotten through it and, and, you know, they haven't decided to like, you know, up and leave everyone and be monogamous with this person. Yeah. I think that this one, I think this one lives in a similar place to me to that idea of like 
the fear that, well, if you're not doing the normal things, like you're going to end up alone and sad someday that, that there's kind of that where it'll even come up with relationships where I have no like reasonable reason to fear this. Like for example, with my relationship with Dedeker, where it's just sort of this, like, well, what if everyone, you know, what if everyone's right? That like, eventually we're, it's a phase and eventually like she'll get over it. <laughs> she'll and get over it. Be monogamous it doesn't and matter I'm, that she wrote this book and does this podcast right. with me. Right. She's going to get over it. Someday. Right. It sounds absurd, but I, I like, and I'm just going to want to find a man with a bigger wallet. <laughs> yeah. To settle whatever, down with. whatever, whatever it is. <laughs> right. All Jeez. those, all, whatever it what, is. It's not how I actually feel. I'm just know, tossing out all the weird toxic stories that, that like, are we, out there. Yeah. yeah. But my point here is that that's an actual like real fear that I have felt. Yeah. Without that being rational. And that's, again, that's kind of what we're talking about here is these, these ghosts that come mm. back to haunt you from these beliefs or this idea of just sort of like, what if, what if the mainstream is right and I'm wrong? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jeez. Uh. Uh, another one that I think comes up for people is just straight up when they're first opening up is it's still f- like, there's still this guilt because it still feels like, cheating in Mm. some way or even expressing to their partner being attracted to someone else or even honestly telling their partner yeah yeah exactly or feeling that urge to downplay liking someone else or wanting to go on a date Mm. with someone else or wanting to have sex with someone else because we feel like oh dear this is you know we've definitely been taught from day one like do not talk to your romantic partner about these things it's (laughs) it's hurtful to tell them these things in the first place yeah you know just Ignore it and forget it and don't talk about it. And then that can definitely keep people trapped. It definitely kept me trapped for a long time in really poor communication habits of Mm. just not getting, you know, really not talking about these things, not getting joy about talking about these things, assuming it's going to be hurtful to a partner. And so I need to either not talk about it or downplay it or, or talk around it or whatever. Yeah. Right. Uh, Mm -hmm. Uh, Um, And I think that it also can, that can breed like expectations being kind of parsed apart in a way that like you, you sit there and say to your partner, like, well, you know, I had sex, but it was, it didn't feel, you know, like when we do, or it it was, Mm. wasn't as good as it is with you or whatever. And then if they see you, exactly. And then if they see you like have NRE or be really excited about maybe going on a trip with that person, they're like, well, wait, like I thought that you didn't feel as good about them. And so I'm surprised that you're doing this, you know, important thing with them when Mm -hmm. I had this impression that you actually weren't that into them. So I think it can breed like things that are not, I don't know, just the poor communication and mm-hmm. and blindsetting someone to a degree just because of that poor communication. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, your family and friends and people you meet can dredge up all kinds of oh, yeah. normative ghosts. <laughs> uh-huh. We've talked about some oh, already. Yeah. yeah. You know, we d- we I think we covered um, a number of these things in one of our live show episodes from two years ago about being non-monogamous within a largely monogamous world. Um, Mm. But, you know, of course, there's all the assumptions that come around, you know, like, you know, just so many people you meet are going to assume you are monogamous. They see you out with a partner. They're going to assume you are monogamous. You are on the relationship escalator. You are doing these things. Um, And so it's kind of like the, the hangover or the ghosts or the echoes can be perpetuated by other people in your life, even if you yourself are not, wanting to maintain that or not ascribe to that um Mm -hmm. you know so it's everything like you know i've heard a lot of people talk about family members even though i'm out to them they still only ask about the well-being of one partner um yeah or they still only ever invite this one particular partner um or you know i don't know all kinds of things like that yeah well what about a fluid bonding what about it yeah, I mean, sure. Well, like, just sure. even even the idea. Sure. Okay, sure. Sorry. Yeah, okay. This is no. not what I was expecting your response. To food bonding, sure, sure, sure. No, but just the idea that like somebody is more important if you fluid bond with them, or that it, like is almost like a relationship escalator esque type <sighs> thing, like. It yeah. means you leveled up with them because you're fluid bonded and, with or them. It's a hierarchy I, kind of thing. Totally. Yeah. Like, I, okay, I, I just want to get in front of y'all uh-huh. okay. and just say get in front of us yep. right now. I think there's kind of a weird paradox here because fluid bonding. And for those of you who don't know what fluid bonding is, 
I don't like the term, first of all, but it's it refers icky. to choosing to have unprotected sex or, you know, an exchange of fluids with a particular person or multiple particular people. That's so what people refer to moist. as. Ugh, it's fluid bonding. Fluid. Um, bonding. <laughs> it just makes me think of chemistry. It's, like chemical it's, just, it's, there's, it's a problematic term. Okay, we can yeah. talk but about that what later. I wanted to, Whole to other get, episode, Jace. Yeah. Whole other episode. What I wanted to get in front of you on was the fact that fluid bonding or choosing to have unprotected sex with somebody, um, it is an intimate thing. I do think it is an intimate thing. Like, I don't want to discredit it as meaning nothing. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it means something. Does that make sense? <laughs> Was that a Zen con? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could... <laughs> that's great. I mean, I, I like to say that about sex too, just in general. Okay. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it is an intimate, I'll, meaningful I'll, thing, I'll but it also doesn't necessarily mean Need anything. To be. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I definitely like made some poor decisions in relationships. Uh, um, you know, I've ascribed fluid. You know, I've kind of assigned fluid bonding to the relationship escalator. Like, I've definitely been in relationships where it's like, well, it's about that time. Uh, that we're feeling serious. We're feeling maybe kind of serious, or I feel so like maybe I have some feels. So the off. condoms are coming off. Um, you know, I've had people thank me to be like, wow, I, I'm really glad to know that you trust me. And this is also, by the way, making this decision purely emotionally, not actually talking about, hey, let's talk about sexual history and let's talk about sexual health. Purely an emotional right. decision of, hey, we feel safe around each other. So let's have unprotected sex, which was mm -hmm. not a wise decision and not anything I would recommend anybody do. Um, but related to that, you know, then when I went on to non-monogamous relationships, I definitely ascribed this whole idea of like, again, me needing to be number one and needing to be special of like, well, I need to be the one that this person is having unprotected sex with. Because if I'm not, and if this person is having unprotected sex with someone else, that means I'm not the most special and we can't have that now, can we? Um, so no. kind of, they all sort of interconnect <laughs> yeah, with each other, Yeah, they huh? really yeah. do. Yeah. They really do. I, I, I don't know. I feel like... My party line and the party line on the show, and it's a party line that's not a party for anyone because it seems like everyone feels like it's a drag, but my party line is always about like, choose to protect yourself first, you know, err on the side of safe sex and maybe err on the side of, you know, maybe kind of maintaining safe sex principles across the board with all of your partners rather than making it different for different people. But people come from all kinds of different contexts and all kinds of different like health backgrounds and needs. And so I don't want to put that out there just as a total blanket statement because I know we're going to get people who are going to um, protest that. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Um, but that's my personal philosophy is is I try not to to make the mistake of thinking that a piece of latex um, carries this huge meaning. Like that, that a piece of latex. Or I was about to say snake skin. Ew, <laughs> Emily. Skin. What is Emily. it? Lamb skin? Emily. <laughs> Emily. That's the new craze. That's uh, the new craze. Snake skin. I don't skin. think that that would <laughs> do em very much. Emily. Every single part of my genitals is I'm horrified so right now. And just right, like, please continue. <laughs> I never want to have sex again. I really didn't, didn't see that coming. However, oh. I can see it looking very fashionable at the same time. Yeah. That's like I'm if kinda you... like, mm, ooh, stylish, but ooh, don't bring that near me. <laughs> it's going to be, like it's gonna clothed be, in yeah. snake skin. Uh, it's going to be on all the uh, nude beaches. Uh, in. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, from here already. to Timbuktu. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Oh boy. Anyway, we've gotta, I feel like I talked yeah. a lot about fluid bonding. I'm sorry. So y'all can chime in. Okay, please cheers. Well, I was just, just going to move on to the next one here is this idea of uh, feeling morally inferior. Because oh, yeah. that's what society's going to tell you, right? Is that you're somehow less morally upstanding than other people who are doing the normal thing. All uh, those, uh, what are all those like different studies that people do where they're like, look at a monogamous person and a non-monogamous mm, person. Yes, mm. we've presented on this. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Like what, what sort of stigmas, what, what beliefs do we have? Uh, a non-monogamous person is less good at brushing their teeth. Is the, is, is the belief. Not true. Exactly. I want to emphasize that's not true. <laughs> I'm kidding. But like that, that's what people like think automatically mm. that they're somehow like morally inferior. Yeah, like less, you said. Well, well, the point of that study was that it's not even just people, the stigma 
means that people make assumptions about this person's morals, but it bleeds over into the rest of their life too. So they yeah, make assumptions. They yeah, are. they make assumptions yeah. about like they're not as good at brushing their teeth, or they're less likely to walk the dog regularly. <laughs> or yeah. Yes, or they're less likely to do their Guilty. taxes on time, or stuff like that. And, and I do, I do want to clarify about that particular study because it does get trotted out from time to time that these were not super significant differences, but just enough to show that there is a little bit of bias Mm -hmm. or like the halo effect is what it's called, kind of leaking over into how we feel about monogamous people versus non-monogamous people. But the other part of it that was interesting is that that same thing held true even for non-monogamous people themselves. Yeah. That they they also had those also, same... Also internalized stigma. Yeah, mm. the stigma against ourselves, kind of. Yeah. Um, and I think the flip side of this is that people can sometimes go to the opposite extreme of needing to really feel morally superior mm. to everyone else, which like, is where... I'm way more evolved than you are. Right, oh, exactly. I definitely have pulled that one before. Oh, for sure, me too. <laughs> it's like the classic polyamory newbie. Um, like that oh, everyone new, goes to that phase. It was like yeah. that, that new video by uh, School of Life that was really annoying where they kind of had some non-monogamous couples talking and everything that the one was, with Dedeker's book in yeah, it? Yeah, the one where they Dedeker's clearly did it. not read my book. <laughs> they did not read her book, first of all. And <laughs> second of all, it around. <laughs> and second of all, I was just listening to them. I was like, yeah, okay. This is a fairly accurate depiction of newbies to polyamory talking about it hey, like it's we this very once. evolved thing. Yeah, absolutely. And just being like, yes, I see that, but... I, it sucks that this video just like ended after that and was like, see clearly ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, just to say like, don't, don't, I know that that comes from this place of being so scared of like being needing morally to compensate inferior. Yeah. yeah for yeah. people seeing you as being mm-hmm. inferior in some yeah. way. Well, that so makes sense. I think a lot of people out there will blame any problems that you have with your relationship on non-monogamy. And you might also internally be like, shit, like, Maybe my life is going to hell right now because I'm non-monogamous. It's like that idea of like, well, it would all just be easier if. If, Yeah. Mm. But like in reality, like if relationships are bad and you're monogamous, like no one's questioning monogamy. Right. It's usually. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, I'm assuming <laughs> for all the time someone's like, oh, well, I tried non-monogamy once and it was real bad. Or like I had a friend who did and it was real bad. I was yeah. like, if we did the same for monogamy, like, oh, I had one of those and it was bad. So I'm never yeah. doing that again. No one would do it either. Yeah. Like it's, that's just a ridiculous way to, no, I've thought about like, to judge yeah. times that like times that I've opened up about really bad relationships in my past, like abusive relationships that happen mm. to also be non-monogamous. And I've had experiences in sharing with people where they're not necessarily like they don't jump right to, Oh, it's because you were being non-monogamous, but they do jump to like kind of trying to use that as an explanation in the sense of like, Oh, well, you I mean, you know, like, like a man who acts like that is definitely not okay with non-monogamy, you know, or like, it's probably not someone who's, who's going to be. So that's why things all fell apart is because, you're like, mm-hmm. you know, that person, <laughs> I'm having a hard time explaining it, but it's just when I think about the opposite of like, if I talked about, yeah, yeah, this person was really shitty and abusive to me. And someone was like, well, you know, you were in a monogamous relationship and, oh, yeah. you know, you did yeah. have to really pitch him on this. Yeah, I don't know. Like it just, we don't hear it. And it's just so ridiculous. And, and, yeah. Yeah. but it's, but again, it's just like otherness the, though, again, like the stigma thing, mm-hmm. it can be internalized oh, as yeah. well, you know, yeah. like that. Like I've seen a lot of people that I know, like clients that I've worked with who do feel like, gosh, maybe if I'm just monogamous, it'll all be simpler. And to be fair, yeah. I do think with some people, they it are making be. an accurate ass- assessment. Like, yeah. like, you know, I definitely don't want to discredit people realizing like, oh, maybe the choice for me is monogamy. I think that's actually great. But I've definitely also seen people kind of just fall back on that. Of, yeah. You know, when there's deeper issues, just kind of assuming like, well, if we close our relationship or if I choose to be monogamous, then none of these issues will come up again, which is often not true Mm -hmm. well and also to go along with that like if you have been dating around for a while and you're non-monogamous and it's been really difficult to find someone that you really like and then all of a sudden you do find someone but they're all not not really all in with the non-monogamy thing then it can probably be really tempting to be like well shit maybe i you know i found someone maybe i should just go back to being monogamous because it is easier and because that's what they want 
Like, like kind of the similar idea, yeah. right? Of like, well, it, maybe it would just be simpler if, if I just like, or adhered. Oh, or even to go back to the one, like, well, well, it's meant to be maybe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know, fate made me meet this person. The, and, it brought us together. And let right? me tell you, like, okay, the last crack I ever took at monogamy, the way, you know, I was, I was at this place in my life where it's like, I've been doing all the reading and I'd already, you know, dated around quite a bit trying to, to pitch people on this non-monogamy thing and it hadn't worked out, but I was still felt so convicted. I was still like, I still feel like this is something I want to try. I want to try to figure it out. I want to try to actually do it. And so when I met this person that I felt like super in love with, but he was definitely monogamous, you know, I would try to have these conversations with him and kind of try to pitch it to him. And the way he would always frame it to me was like, how can it be so hard to just be with me? Like, like, what like are you afraid of? Challenge. Yes, like, that it was a challenge. Ugh. Like he posed it as like, this is the easiest thing ever. You know, Look like, at how awesome I know I am. you can Come do, on. like, like, of course you can do this. It's like, it's not that difficult to commit or whatever. And that totally but almost like me. he was telling you, you were taking like the easy way out of like, what do you think this is too hard? Oh, for cause you? I didn't, I didn't read it. Oh, uh, okay. Well, do you know I what I mean? Know. Cause it seems like, is it really so hard to do this? Makes it seem to me like, oh, well, you're just not doing monogamy because you, you don't have like the chutzpah for it. You yeah, know? I guess like, it was kind of like that or, just or like, like kind of assuming it's aren't like, aren't I enough? Like but there was definitely, I don't know, there was all kinds of stuff wrapped up in it. But I feel like I yeah. remember the moment very clearly because I remember it hitting me and, and it producing this sense of like, well, yeah, I can do that. Like, that's not too hard for me. Like, of course I can do that when you put it that way. Um, yeah. You know, don't try to imply that I can't do something. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I took the bait and... Uh, that didn't work out so well. Didn't work out so well, but... You know, I can be thankful that it did help me realize that. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, that again, just help me realize, okay, no, truly monogamy is not really the thing for me. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's like a lot of different ways that these sort of ghosts can show up. And, and, you know, as you could tell by when we're talking about this, that it's like, oh yeah. And this one's connected to this other thing. And like, oh yeah, there's this. It's like, it's because it's all like this big knotted together ball of different threads, right? Of different beliefs or different ideas we've been taught or different things we've been told we should do or we should want. And maybe that we have wanted at different times that they're so intertwined with each other. I think that's why these, these ghosts can linger like that because it's not just one thing. It's not like, Oh, I changed my belief about this one thing. And now I think differently. Yes. It's like, no, there's, there's all this other stuff tied together with it that you're trying to pull out that one and it can take a while for everything to get untangled, you know? Yes, definitely. Definitely. So we wanted to also uh, present you with some possible solutions or as I like to call them counter spells um, as they're referred to in the relationship anarchist manifesto. Um, oh yeah. That's where that's from. I was like, yes. did you coin that term in your book? No, Missy? <laughs> I'm definitely not going to take, take credit for that. Um, so uh, even just starting from the place of understanding that this kind of hangover dealing with these kind of ghosts that come up, totally normal, totally understandable. It's like, we're the products of the culture that we're raised in. Yeah. We're the products of the messages that we're raised with. It's not necessarily like your fault and you're not a bad person for still having mm. these feelings come up. So have a little bit of compassion have a little bit of awareness and just know that like it is okay and it is okay to recognize them and have the awareness to be like, Oh yeah, I know what that is. I can label that as like, that's, you know, this old soulmate mythology, or that's this old assumption that, you know, monogamy is morally superior or whatever it is for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another one is community. Mm. Just like try and and we obviously talk about this a lot on the show because we have a huge, awesome community within our Patreon uh, people, all you Patreon <laughs> people. Uh -huh. And then also just like, I think the three of us have community within each other and within people who know all about what mm. we're going through and what we've been through and we're able to help them. But if you're able to just speak about things that are occurring in your life, things that like come up and that are challenging on a daily or weekly basis and just like be able to have some empathy for yourself and for each other. I think it's a huge, huge, hugely helpful thing. Yeah. Going along with that with community is just outlets to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's just to be able to talk about it with people who go, 
oh yeah, I totally get that. I understand that, but it's gotten better. You know, people who actually, who get it, which yeah. goes along with finding a community that you can talk to. Um, and then the last one is uh, role models and mentors, which again comes from that community of like having people who've been doing this longer than you and who have an understanding of these things who can kind of help you to work through this. I know for me, um, you know, because sometimes it can be hard to find specific role models or specific mentors who are going through the same thing that you are or trying the same thing that you are. Um, for me, I still get a lot of inspiration from finding role models who are people who are still like bucking trends and bucking normativity and trying to forge their own path. Um, even if it's not necessarily like about, let's say, non-monogamy specifically or anything in particular. Um, I just want to give a shout out because um, I follow on Instagram this model, Aiden, Aiden, Aiden. I think it's Aiden. Maybe it's Aiden. I don't know. Um, Aiden, hello. Aiden yeah, Dowling, no. uh, who was um, the it's first, yeah. the very first uh, trans man to ever be on the cover of Men's Health magazine. Oh, that's um, awesome. Right, right. And he oh, does yeah. these like really, really amazing posts and talks a lot about his past, even like posts a lot of, you know, pictures, uh, you know, from his past and kind of show, talks a lot about his growth. And even though I'm not personally on this journey of, you know, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, exploring outside of like the gender that I was assigned at birth or anything like that, I still find it extremely encouraging and extremely hope producing of like, Hey, there's someone out there who has this courage to, to kind of go against the mainstream and find what was right for them and find all this fulfillment and happiness in that. And so I can do that for myself too, in this other arena. So it's also good to find role models or mentors who inspire you in that way. It doesn't have to be an exact mirror image of what you're going through. Sweet. Yeah. Anyway, and related to that, I would also love to hear what other people uh, would recommend as far as, well, it doesn't have to be Instagram accounts, um, but people that they're <laughs> inspired, people who are kind of going against the grain and forging their own path. I love yeah. hearing about that kind it's of stuff. It's great hearing about more yes. like, people like yeah, that. To, we, to need, to we need more for sure. Definitely. Um, we'd definitely love to hear. I mean, a lot of people have sounded off in the Patreon group about the specific ways that, you know, monogamy hangover has influenced their lives, but we'd definitely love to hear what are your ghosts of normative past? <laughs> what are the things that you're trying to exercise on a daily basis? Um, the best place to share your thoughts and to share that with us and with other listeners is on this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook group or Discord chat. You can get access to these groups and you can join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at info at multiamory.com. You can leave us a voicemail at 678-M-U-L-T-I-05. Or you can leave us a voice message on Facebook. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Emily Matlack, and me, Dedeker Winston. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanera. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our production assistant is Nicole Samra. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. Hey, this is Dan Savage from the Savage Lovecast and Savage Love. You're listening to a Swing Set podcast at Swing Set FM.